Well, that's fine. Then I can you just how many people are in? Can you text me? Maybe. Good morning, everybody. We're just going to give it a minute or two to let everybody join. Give it one more minute, everybody. Got a few people hopping on now. Okay, well, let's get started. Good morning, everybody I'm joining us online today. Uh, we'll start with a little housekeeping today. Um, during today's uh, um, forum, we, you can put questions in the chat or Q&A function, and we'll address all the questions at the end. We, we look forward to it. Well, um, so please, if you have any questions, put them in, and we'll, we'll have a Q&A at the end. Um, just let me introduce myself quickly. My name is Todd Underwood. I am the Strategic Marketing Manager for SIFT. Uh, just tell you a little bit about SIFT for maybe people who are joining us for the first time. Um, um, well, the Ohio MEP is part of a nationwide public-private partnership with centers in all 50 states and Puerto Rico, and we're dedicated to serving small and medium-sized manufacturers. SIFT is one of six center affiliates in the state of Ohio. Our vision is to be partners in solutions innovation for food manufacturing and agribusiness. Um, we work hard to achieve this vision through a unique blend of direct services we provide, a membership consortium made up of leading companies in the food space, and a vast network of resources and other partnerships. Our goal is to increase competitiveness and growth in Northwest Ohio and throughout the state and the food industry. Um, this agribusiness forum kind of helps us with that mission by highlighting trends, new innovations, and more important topics once a month when we meet. Today, I'm very excited to introduce our presenter, her name is Marissa Dake, and she serves as the Director of Communications and Public Affairs for DNO Produce in Columbus, Ohio. DNO Produce is a distributor of fresh cut and bulk produce and specializes in making healthy produce options for the K through 12 service sector. She was raised in a farming family. Marissa has plenty of experience baling hay, harvesting produce, wrangling cattle, driving tractors, and fighting unruly roosters, which sounds pretty terrifying to me. She is passionate about protecting and strengthening the local agriculture systems and hopes to use her skills to see an expanded access to local produce in our schools. Um, she began her career at age 19, running a children's program at the community center in her hometown of Topeka, Kansas. After college, uh, she moved to Washington, D.C. and served as a Senate intern and then worked um, for Michael Torrey Associates, a government affairs firm. And during the pandemic, she returned to Kansas and led a distribution program for the USDA Farmers to Families Food Box Program. Um, Marissa's experiences drove her to pursue a career at the nexus of farming, policy, and food insecurity. She considers herself privileged to have found DNO Produce, which provides fresh produce to schools in a way that is accessible to children. So on that note, I'm very excited to hear this presentation. Uh, good morning, Marissa, and welcome. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me, um, Todd and Angie. I'm gonna share my screen here. Thanks everybody for getting up on a um, Thursday morning at 8.30. 
um, and joining us um, here. It's a perfect week to talk about school nutrition. Everybody's headed back to school this week. Um, we have been really busy here at DNO, um, ramping up, gearing up for the school year. Um, schools are starting to order um, all sorts of fun stuff from us. And so um, it's been a really fun week. Just a little fun tidbit. I was just telling um, the SIF staff, Todd and Angie, that um, we do a cookout for our employees to kind of kick off the beginning of the school year. So we did our cookoff for our first and second shift um, on Tuesday. We did a barbecue. And then um, last night we did our third shift. So we were here actually um, around midnight to 2 a.m. this morning doing um, pancakes, eggs, bacon, um, fresh cut fruit um, for our team. So I have been um, here all week um, and it's, it's been a really wonderful time as we get geared up and excited for school to start. So I'm gonna talk about from the farm field to the lunchroom table, on um, the power of fresh produce and school nutrition. But first I wanted to start by just sharing a little bit about myself, um, which Todd, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, so like Todd said, I grew up in a farming family. Um, my dad's side, my dad's a fifth generation farmer um, and we are located just south of Topeka. So um, have lots of experience. You can see that's me on the left um, where they're checking cattle. Um, my dad also um, raises and custom harvests hay, so you can kind of see the bale there. We have livestock. Um, only the goats will take selfies with me, so that's one of our goats, um, Dalmatian. And then we also have um, a several produce high tunnels, so that's one of my good friends um, there helping me. Um, we are actually weeding. You can see in her hands she's pulling weeds. So um, have spent a lot of time um, on our farm, and especially during my teenage years and my young adult years, that's when we really started ramping up. Um, the farming business. Um, but at the same time during those years, I also spent a lot of time working in low-income communities. Um, so this is the Avondale Center in Topeka. It's a community center in an area with a pretty high poverty rate, um, high crime rate. The housing conditions are um, really quite poor. And um, I got hired on as an intern at 19 at this community center and uh, nonprofit, you wear all the hats. So uh, they entrusted me to lead children and youth programming um, at the community center, coordinate all the volunteers. And one of the programs there on the right was a summer food service program site. So summer food service program is a USDA, it's a government program. Um, before the pandemic, um, it was really only highly targeted for low income areas, but USDA provides a meal, a lunchtime meal for kids during the summer, they can, you know, it's through a church, a community center, sometimes it's located at schools. Um, and I ran a site there. So it was 80 kids and me and one other staff, and then sometimes volunteers and sometimes not. So I have lots of really wild stories from my summers heading that program up. Um, but it really gave me a front row seat to the challenges that kids especially face, um, you know, being born into a family or community that's that's low income. And I really saw acutely what food insecurity and nutrition insecurity looked like um, in, in working with these kids and um, just the hunger that they were experiencing coming to me at lunchtime. Um, that was oftentimes the only meal that they ate. So um, I learned a ton. And um, you know, upon completing school, that really drove me to consider how I could make bigger systems level impact in food insecurity. Um, I wanted to do something in kind of the legal policy space that could benefit more than just the kids that were under my, my care, um, but also kind of the larger um, ecosystem of kids that don't have access to things like this. So um, that um, drove me to apply for an internship on Capitol Hill with one of the Kansas lawmakers. Um, so that's me in the middle, um, getting a tour of the Capitol Dome. I interned for the Senate, um, Senator Jerry Moran of Kansas. Um, you can't really see clearly in the back there, but that's the um, Washington Monument um, and, the, and the National Mall. It was a very windy day. Um, so I did that internship on Capitol Hill, also learned so, so much, um, got to, you know, really had no legislative background or experience, had a front row seat to the policymaking process um, and, and just um, grew exponentially through that. Um, and then went from there to a firm, um, a government affairs firm that specialized in food and ag policy. Um, so on the left there, that's myself and one of my interns uh, at USDA. It's at the FFA national meeting. If you can see the blue jackets there in the back, um, we, were, we were a sponsor for a table. Our firm was um, very, very involved with FFA. 
And then on the right at US Chamber of Commerce, um, I would go to meetings, a lot of really big meetings, like hundreds of hundreds of people all representing different industries and clients. So I would go, you know, sit in these meetings. Uh, these were, this is when um, uh, NAFTA was being renegotiated um, and it's now USMCA. It's an international trade agreement with Canada and Mexico. So I would go um, to these briefings on um, that trade policy, take notes for clients. Um, and, and our clients at the firm were farmers, kind of in that industrial um, agricultural sector. So corn farmers, soybean, wheat, sorghum, dairy, large scale animal ag. Um, and then our firm also works in the anti-hunger policy space as well. So around March of 2020, um, the world changed really dramatically and um, everything shut down. So I was teleworking for my firm and um, decided to go back to Kansas for some of the teleworking and um, was made aware of a really unique opportunity to work um, in food relief during the pandemic specifically. Um, USDA put together a program in a matter of weeks in April of 2020 called Farmers to Families Food Box Program. And that was really in response to the shaken supply chains. Um, it really wasn't an anti-hunger program um, in, its, in its outset. It was really a stabilization, a market stabilization program. So some of y'all might have heard of this or participated in this, but essentially USDA contracted with companies to, um, you know, he, they bought their product, they bought their um, excess food product, much of which was produce, um, aggregated it and put it into boxes, mixed, you know, mixed boxes of food, and then gave it to nonprofits to redistribute um, to families in need. And because this was a emergency, never, you know, black swan event, never happened before type of program, um, there was a lot of creativity and flexibility needed to jump in and, and be part of it. So a nonprofit that I volunteered with in college, um, affiliated with the community center, um, received, uh, you know, we're told they were gonna receive food, a lot more food than they anticipated. They called me to just ask for some advice at first. Um, and the, the longer we, we spoke, the more they realized, and I realized that they needed someone to just spearhead this and manage the food. So I worked for them. I um, left my cushy DC job, took a major, major pay cut and went to work and redistribute all of this food. And, and I do not regret it one bit. It was an opportunity of a lifetime. Um, so we worked with about 4 million pounds of food over a year and a half. At the outset, we really thought it would just be about six months, um, but we, um, took in and then redistributed about 4 million pounds of food. There's, I learned how to drive a forklift. You can see me over there. I'm not a great forklift driver, but I do have a certification certificate to say I can do it. Um, and then um, over there on the right um, is a granddad and his granddaughter that we delivered a food box to. This is in the Monroe, Monroe neighborhood of Topeka. Um, his story is actually a really great example of when all these kiddos couldn't go to school, um, mom and dad still have to have to work. And um, grandpa and grandma, um, for a lot of the, the folks that we served, it was, it was grandparents who were on a fixed income who all of a sudden had a ton of kiddos that they were responsible for feeding, um, apart from folks who, of course, were dealing with layoffs, furloughs, um, or folks who were already kind of teetering at that poverty level that were struggling um, to make it through the pandemic. So through that experience, um, I saw a really powerful effect that fresh produce had on families. Um, the produce is not often something um, that people um, see that they, that they deserve to have or that they should have. It's seen as maybe a luxury um, by some. And it really shocked me. I had a mom um, break down in tears because there were grapes in the box and she wanted her kid to have grapes and she was so, so thankful. Um, I got to see kids just tear open a bag of apples and just eat them on the spot. Um, I had a family cheer about zucchini, which was the weirdest thing ever. I've never seen someone cheer about zucchini, um, but it, it really stopped and made me think um, and wonder, you know, coming from a farming family, why is this seen as, as such a treat and such a luxury? So that really piqued my interest. Um, and, and I wanted to, you know, with that enthusiasm, kind of continue my learning experience and, and seek out ways to, to be at this nexus of of food insecurity and then also realizing nutrition insecurity. Um, I also dealt with um, uh, the government contractors who were paid by USDA, the, the farms, and then the aggregator distributors. Um, DNO would be an example of this, um, not to me in Kansas, but um, they were doing that, we were doing that here. 
um, for Ohio and Michigan. So I, I really spent a lot of time interacting with the produce industry um, through the job. And it made me realize that, you know, private sector has a huge role to play in addressing these systemic issues. You know, farmers are the ones growing the food and they need to make a profit. Um, aggregator distributors, fresh cut processors are the ones who make it accessible and get it to the end user. And they also need to make a profit, their businesses. Um, and so I realized that I needed to get, I had a lack in understanding between nonprofit um, and then policy, I was missing that industry piece. Um, so I was um, serving on a board, giving feedback about farmers to families. And so was um, our president, Alex. Um, and so I just ended up asking him for advice on how to direct my career um, over the last few months of the program as we knew it would be phased out. Um, and then I'm very, very fortunate that we began to speak about what a role might look like for me here. Um, and so after finishing up the program um, last fall, I moved from Kansas to Ohio. There's not a lot of us here, um, but I'm really, really thankful that I did um, end up at DNO. Uh, I just have been so, so pleased um, to see the mission and the vision of the company internally now, um, as much as I could see it externally, as I was getting to know Alex. Um, and I just, I just believe this is a company that's doing things differently. Um, and I'm just, I'm, I'm very thankful and pleased to be here and I'm really excited about what we're doing. So I started here in November of 2021. You can see um, we have a very fun, I did not, this is not my idea, this watermelon helmet. Um, that was one of my colleagues' ideas. We have a very young, energetic, enthusiastic team um, who shows up in your office and says, put this on your head, here's a watermelon helmet. Um, so we, we have a lot of fun here. Um, we also wear our dinosaur shirts. We do, <laughs> we do a lot of um, fun themed things for our schools. Um, so this is us at um, the uh, Child Nutrition Conference this last fall. Um, but we do obviously take our business seriously. We wanna make sure that we are excellent partners um, in the school nutrition space and with our other customer segments, providing you know, the absolute best product that we can, the absolute best partnership and service that we can. And sometimes we do that while we wear water watermelon helmets. So. Um, that's enough about me. I want to talk a little bit about DNO. So we're a distributor of fresh cut and whole bulk produce here in Columbus, Ohio. We have about a 500 mile distribution radius and that reaches about 15 states. So we have customers in about 15 states um, and we're an exclusive provider for fresh health. So that's our private label and that's the fresh cut side of it. So fresh cut fruits and vegetables, which um, I'll talk quite a bit about as part of our time here today. Um, but we really pride ourselves in having a wide variety of produce items available. Um, we, we do a ton uh, of different things, star fruit, jicama, um, kiwis, strawberries. I mean, we do, we do it all. Um, and we also pride ourselves with the fresh cut side in making that produce as accessible and easy for the end user to consume as possible. Um, many of those um, end users are children, um, and it's really important for us to make that something that they can, they can access and we also pride ourselves in being really involved in those spaces um, where there are those vulnerable populations. You know, school, um, school nutrition is a major um, uh, place where low-income children or vulnerable children receive their nutrition. And, and like I experienced at the Avondale Center, um, sometimes it's the only meal that they receive in a day. Um, so we take that very seriously um, in, in all aspects, you know, food safety, offerings, um, how we work with schools, providing educational resources and the like. Um, we also do work with food banking and other government programs. Um, we, and we also work with the government to provide produce for the military. Um, so a little bit about um, the history of DNO. Um, the business looked a lot different when it started. DNO produces a family business, a family company. The DeNovo family has quite the legacy of produce here in Ohio. There are four generations that have been involved in produce, um, starting kind of with the patriarch, um, Sam DeNovo, who immigrated from Italy and started a produce um, cart here in the Columbus area. Um, and then Sam's great grandson, Alex, is our current president and CEO. Um, DNO itself was founded in 1989 um, by Tony DeNovo, Alex's dad, who I believe I saw is on um, today. And it's grown um, from more so the wholesaler side um, to now we do a lot of, of work on that. Um, fresh cut side as well. We've got nearly 200 employees. Um, and what we do is um, not just school items. So I will talk a little bit about some of our other offerings. So we still do wholesale. 
Um, we work with both conventional and organic. We do domestic and imported. We offer warehousing and logistics solutions as well. Um, so cross stocking, cold storage, logistics, freight forwarding. We're working with all these farms. We've got great partnerships with them, um, with our grower partners. We um, do a ton in the school space. I'll, I'll touch on that more, so I'll just glaze over it now. Um, we do bulk fresh cut. So that would be for kind of the food service segments. Um, we'll do kind of more of that industrial food service. We'll, we'll do packaging and blends like fajita mixes, pico de gallo, things of that nature. We do have a retail segment that would be things like grab and go cups that you would get um, either at the grocery store or the gas station. And then a really nice um, little meal kitting segment. Um, those kind of mid-sized pre-portioned and pre-packaged cut um, items. Um, and so that's it's that kind of interests me and fascinates me that this meal kitting is, is continued to be a trend. Um, we have a um, great robust um, group of grower partners um, that we work with. Um, we do import internationally. Domestic is, is a lot of what we do because we are working with government programs and there is a um, USA um, grown um, distinguishing, uh, there's distinguishing language in government contracting on things being USA grown. Um, but we do have um, a pretty robust supplier approval program before we bring on a new grower partner, that would be things like third party audits, um, the HACCP plan, certify, um, you know, certificate of insurance, things like that, our quality assurance team, really um, vets our, our new suppliers before they come on with us. Um, we also have our organic certification through OFA, the Ohio Ecological Farm and Food Association. Um, and then we also do um, local and regional programs. Um, we're a founding member of Ohio Proud. Um, and then we're also um, involved in some programs in Michigan. So we are part of their Farm to Institution Board and their Michigan 10 cents a meal program, which is a state um, reimbursement program for schools to menu Michigan grown items. And um, this is just one of our grower partners. Um, I just took a group to tour this um, farm in April, um, Todd Granier Farms, a wonderful couple and their three daughters, and then they have a great team. Um, they grow some tree fruit and then they also grow asparagus and the bulk of what we do with them is that asparagus program. Um, food safety, as um, everyone probably can relate, is very paramount um, for our work as I'm, as I'm sure it is for everybody here. Um, you know, specifically because so many of our customers are children, um, there's, there's a huge responsibility on our shoulders um, to make sure that the food that we produce is safe for kids, that no child's gonna get sick, uh, there's no contamination, um, either from the farm or from something in house. So we do have 24 seven um, food safety processes. We have a whole shift dedicated to sanitation, actually our third shift. So the folks we had, we had um, a cookout with last night, um, but they do um, testing. We, we have quality checks throughout our receiving and processing um, process. Um, and then, of, of course, we make sure to vet all our vendors to ensure that they meet our food safety qualifications and then those of our um, government um, agencies that, that we work with. So now I'd like to zoom in a little bit on school nutrition. Um, that's, that's pretty much our bread and butter here at DNO. And that's because our passion is to change the trajectory of kids' lives through feeding them healthy access or feeding them healthy, easy to access produce at school. Um, we believe that, you know, there's a kind of a threefold impact. Um, Alex um, DeNovo, our president, kind of said it best that there's, you know, first off, you have the child at school when you feed them produce, you know, they're receiving high quality, nutrient dense food at school. That's a huge win. Um, but the secondary impact is that child's going to go home and say, mom, mom, I had a kiwi today. Um, so they're not just receiving it at school, but the child has an opportunity to influence their circle, their parents, their siblings, and ideally spending decisions outside of school, um, kind of increasing consumption for the family. You know, my dream is that when a kid comes home from school um, and goes to the grocery store with mom or dad, that they drag them to the produce aisle and say, I want a mango, I want more mango. Um, and that, that you know, mom and dad will, will get some mango um, for, for, for the family. Um, and then in addition to this, um, there's a great potential to impact a child's eating habits for the future. You know, if, if a child has um, access and exposure in formative years with produce, it's likely that they will eat it again in the future. I'm sure a lot of you can name a fruit or vegetable that you never had till you were an adult. Mango would be one for me. Um, maybe it's jicama. That one's a new for me. New for me. Um, maybe you had your first actual farm fresh tomato. 
and you realized it's amazing. Um, you know, and, and it created that a good, a good BLT. That's like our family's summer thing is like farm fresh tomatoes, our neighbor raises pork, and then we have the lettuce and all right. It's just, that's like my favorite. Um, but just, you know, exposing kids to these items as early and often as possible, making them accessible is a huge focus for us. Um, and, you know, for us, increasing produce consumption um, is going to be a key to that. Um, not just uh, increasing sales. It's not really a good long-term strategy for us as a business to just try and sell more produce in the short term. We're really trying to increase consumption, which is where um, the fresh cut side comes in. So think about apple slices. That's been around. That's tried and true. You know, if you give a kid an apple, a seven-year-old, you know, or if you're, you're a seven-year-old and someone hands you an apple, that thing is like half the size of your head, your teeth are falling out or your teeth are wiggly. Um, that's pretty intimidating, just trying to eat a whole apple by yourself. Um, you're not going to try and tackle that beast, right? The world is hard enough at, at seven years old. Um, but when you slice that apple up or even dice it up, tidbit, whatever, um, all of a sudden it becomes a whole lot easier to consume that apple. Um, so consumption and accessibility is huge for us. Um, and with that too, we want to, you know, pique kids' interests. We want to make produce an adventure for children. So we use a ton of, you know, different items. A lot of um, places still stick to the good old baby carrots and apple slices model. And I think that works, um, you know, for, for some, if that's the extent that they want to do, but we want to, again, increase consumption. We're looking at the long game here. Um, so we're, we're menuing things like cucumber slices, radishes, um, sugar snap peas. Um, we're trying to expand kids' palates. So there's all these flavors, textures, colors that we can explore. It's approachable. And then we pre-portion and package that food to a USDA um, creditable serving size. That's a huge part of school nutrition is making sure that USDA is um, going to be able to approve and reimburse the food that you're serving to your school. So then I'm going to switch over to now what's happening at school. So that's what's happening over here. But what's happening at the school level that's making this, um, paving this way for us to be able to to offer our products in schools. Um, so first off, um, kind of is clear research. Um, so, you know, first off, it's, it's pretty widely known and understood um, at this point in, in, in 2022 that fresh fruits and vegetables are key to a healthy diet. Um, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans actually call us to, to make half our plate fruits and vegetables. And I know if we're all thinking, you know, even those of us that work for produce company, um, we're probably all falling uh, pretty woefully short of that. Um, and the research shows that about um, you know, nine out of 10 Americans aren't um, you know, meeting these guidelines. Um, and you know, the research is there in terms of the impact of produce. The Eat Lancet report on food plan and health talks about food being the single strongest lever to optimize human health and environmental sustainability on earth. Um, you know, again, widely known, we have an issue of, of diet related illnesses um, in this country and, and beyond, things like high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, and fruit and vegetables are pretty key to be able to combat these. It's, it's pretty difficult to reverse these um, dietary issues without fr fruits and vegetables as part of it. Um, the Eat Lancet report um, also says that, you know, unhealthy diets at this point now pose a greater risk to morbidity and more mortality than alcohol, drug, tobacco use, and unsafe sex combined. Um, so that's pretty, pretty serious. Um, so when it comes to our leaders in school nutrition and in nutrition, both in the government space and in the private sector, there's a general recognition that, you know, we're going to need to make some changes and in investments now, or there will be, you know, things to pay on the back end. It's, it's kind of a pay now or pay later kind of a situation. And we are already seeing those increased costs with those diet related chronic health issues. So we are already paying in some senses and, and we've really got to curb the trend here. Um, another um, thing that's happening in schools is changing parent preferences and perceptions. Um, so a 2020 study done by the Department of Health and Human Services um, talks about parents play a key role in influencing their children's eating habits. And specifically, there's a positive, a very strong positive correlation between the parental perception of school meals and school meal participation. So when parents perceive that school meals are healthy, um, they're more likely to increase their child's participation in school meals. And so there's an incentive there from the school nutrition provider's side, the school's side, to menu healthy items and produce items. 
and again, perception is, is a key word there because um, kind of the millennial generation is coming into parenthood. Um, I know I think I have like six friends with newborns right now. Um, and they are thinking very um, consciously about what their kids are going to be eating um, and, and all the things they're going to expose their kids to, not just food, but you know, technology and, and what kind of shows and, and media, right? They're being really conscious about things like that. That's that's a pretty defining marker of, of that generation. And that's also a, a a factor of the information age. So over here on the right, I wish I had a clearer screenshot, but this is the Georgia tray of the week uh, social media campaign. I got to hear from the Georgia Department of Education um, in July on um, their some of their initiatives to raise awareness of healthy options in schools. And they put this on social media. Every week they have a Georgia tray of the week competition. Um, and as you can see, look, they've got honeydew and cantaloupe. Um, they've got fresh sliced cucumber. They've got uh, grape tomatoes or cherry tomatoes, maybe. They've got carrots. Look, this looks like cooked corn. Um, and they've got maybe some rice and, and some beef there. But, um, you know, what kinds of foods we're feeding our kids is just more and more visible and accessible. Parents can go to the school's website or even get it in their inbox, knowing exactly what their child's eating, the nutrition profile of that. And parents are engaging. They want to influence um, what's being served, what the schools are menuing. What else is happening? Um, we're just seeing um, awesome technological improvements that are paving the way for produce to get into schools and into the general market in a fresher state and with a longer shelf life. If you go back 10 to 15 years and you didn't live in Salinas Valley, you didn't live um, up in Michigan where they um, grow all those amazing berries and apples, um, the, cold chain, the cold chain technology might have um, proposed quite a challenge to get produce to you in a state that was fresh and tasty and good and um, produce is highly perishable. So as soon as it's harvested, it's, it's, got, a, it's got a shelf life, a quickly deteriorating shelf life. Um, so that maintained cold chain and those technological advances are very key um, to ensure that you know, from farm to tray, that food maintains its quality and safety. Um, and then finally, we are seeing, you know, there's, there's going to continue to be, there is and there will continue to be increasing government incentives that are paving the way for school nutrition um, to plate more produce. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the Dietary Guidelines of America um, recommends half the plate. Um, so that, that is something that you know, they're aiming for. And then also this is happening with state legislatures, um, federal initiatives, as well like child nutrition reauthorizations. So for us, um, you know, it's really important to make healthy food as accessible as possible. Um, so these are just some of the things that we do, um, you know, to prepare and fresh cut produce um, to, um, to, to be fun, engaging and accessible. So one, just one more example that I'll give is we have a crinkle cut um, slicer. Um, so instead of carrot sticks, instead of menuing carrot sticks, you can menu a crinkle cut carrot coin, or you can menu a crinkle cut radish. Um, this is a very interactive way to plate a vegetable for a kid. They can play with the ridges, right? It might even emulate a specific kind of potato chip. Um, they can bend it, they can snap it, they can nibble down the, the ridges. Um, just like when you were a kid and you would eat your animal cracker and you bite off the head first, right? Like same kind of concept. We're trying to create that experience with our crinkle cut um, offerings. But we do a ton of different, um, you know, we'll dice, we'll tidbit, um, and we'll also blend. So we also custom, depending on the age of the child, a high schooler is not going to, you know, necessarily want little tiny pineapple tidbits. They'll probably eat a pineapple spear, right? Um, so just kind of considering, you know, what is the age appropriate um, size and cut um, for those kids? Um, even things like how we cut broccoli, how finely we cut broccoli, things like that. Um, you know, providing a diverse selection of items. So this isn't even all of it. Um, it just, the font got too small, but if you, you know, jump anywhere on this list, you know, we offer so many of these things to our school. So, ugly, you know, ugly fruit plums, we do zucchini squash, um, golden beets, red beets. Um, we'll do mixes. So we'll do like um, a celery, a celery radish pack or a celery grape tomato pack. That one's very popular. Um, so we'll also do combo packs um, for schools for kids. Um, we do offer to, I'll, I'll point it out if I have a photo of it, but, um, oh yeah. I'll show you these. Um, so for example, here's some red pepper strips. 
here. This is what I want to show you guys. Um, we also um, provide some of our packaging in cups. So we do bagging and, and then we do these cups. Um, these cups underneath here have a desiccant, a small layer of desiccant packet. It's kind of sealed into the cup. Um, it's one where we, it can't be dislodged easily and potentially eaten by a curious child. Um, but these, that desiccant um, pack absorbs the moisture of the fruit. So things like watermelon that really juice out, it will absorb that and keep the watermelon fresh. Um, the, um, these cups have like an easy peel top, almost like you would think like a yogurt cup lid. Um, so it really makes it easy for kids. And again, these are portioned um, per USDA regulations. Um, like I mentioned, our apple grape, um, that's one of our really popular ones. And then I really like this one. Um, this is a watermelon radish coins. Um, it's the only pink vegetable that I have heard of, um, but it's, um, it's basically like a milder version of a radish. Um, and it's, it's a root vegetable, right? It's, you know, not going to be a kid's potentially their favorite over something like pineapple, but it is a very fun and kind of delightful, um, thing to menu with kids. Okay. Um, and then we've got, yeah, our local asparagus program. I'll talk a little bit about our partnership, um, with our Michigan asparagus program, but, um, I'll point out here, we, we work with a lot of our schools on how to market this. Um, so we use a lot of descriptor words like spiny. Uh, one of my uh, food service directors I was talking to uh, menued her asparagus spears as dinosaur spikes. And I really liked that. I thought that was very clever um, to get kids to eat it. That sounds so much more cool than um, asparagus spears. Um, so we really feel like it's our responsibility also to help out um, the amazing school nutrition professionals who are doing the work of you know serving the food to the kids, preparing the whole meal, um, I mean, they are incredible people. They're managing huge budget budgets. They're feeding thousands of kids a day, multiple meals. So one way that we can do that is by providing material, marketing material, resourcing for them. So this is an example of our item sheets. So we have one for every item that we offer. Um, they can put this in the cafeteria. They can send this to parents. They can give it to classroom teachers. We, we do participate in some classroom snack programs like the fresh fruit and vegetable program. Um, so we provide items like this. We also do um, provide a curated calendar so that they know what's in season. You know, we have a really wonderful procurement team here that has a finger on the pulse of both the domestic and the international market, what's gonna be in season. And with some programs like the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Snack Program, we can use imported product, which is very fun. Um, but they'll get together with our um, sales team, put their heads together and curate a menu that takes into consideration, okay, what's coming on and what's in season and what's something really fun and unique um, that we can offer to schools. Um, so we offer these materials free of charge. They're on our website. I mean, even if, you know, there's a school in, um, you know, Alaska that we don't serve, they are welcome to download and use our materials. Um, they're there for free, they're free of charge. And, you know, the goal is again, to, to integrate into that learning process or that experience of eating the food, also hearing about it, reading about it, um, touching, tasting, smelling, all of those things. Um, we also do um, a local and regional sourcing programs for schools. Um, so this is um, some folks from the Michigan Department of Education and the Michigan Department of Agriculture. Um, we went and toured um, Todd Grenier Farms, that asparagus farm I mentioned earlier, um, but we, we do a program there. I'd love to see it expand. It's like a dream of mine to see it expand, but essentially the state legislature puts a reimbursement amount out um, where they will reimburse the school a certain amount of money to plate a Michigan produce item or a dry bean that's grown in Michigan. Um, and then they can use those funds at their own discretion. So they can hire another staff person or they can get new equipment um, or they can buy more produce. So um, it's a really great program. Okay. So all that to say, I'll open it up for questions here in just a moment, but um, we're, we're really excited. The future is bright, um, bright for kids in terms of, of the technological advances and the, and the ways that we're trying to push the envelope and innovate new things um, for kids to be able to experience and um, to have a regular interaction with fresh produce. Um, the future is bright for their families. Like I said earlier, um, being able to come home and say, I really wanna have a cantaloupe um, is huge for us. Um, and, and having them go or, or fresh pico de gallo or a fajita blend. Um, it's huge for us. Um, the future is bright for produce and for agriculture. 
there's a lot of opportunity um, to kind of expand both on the regional, the local and regional side here in the Great Lakes region, um, but also across the country. Um, and the future is right here um, with DNO and with our Fresh Health line. Um, we're really excited. Um, we've continued to see um, a lot of attention and energy on um, what we're doing, which is a great sign. Um, and we are, are really thankful and grateful to be doing this at this, at this kind of pivotal moment. Um, that said, before I open up for questions too, please um, feel free. We'd love to have you follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. Um, you can also sign up for our emails on our website, um, but just keeping up with what we're doing. Um, we do a lot of work in the nutrition and security space as a company too. So we had a partnership with Mid-Ohio Food Collective in their kitchen this summer. Um, we do a lot of work with Food Rescue Columbus. They're a wonderful partner for us. Um, but if you want to follow kind of what we're up to and see what we're innovating next, um, we'd love to have you come follow us on social media. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. All right. Thanks, Maritza. That was great. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the um, Q&A or the chat. Um, <clears throat> we do have one question so far. Um, that is, does your company worry about the impact or sustainability of the plastic packaging on the grab and go or individually packed portions? There's a lot of potential trash in the landfill. Yep, that's a great question. And that is definitely something that we talk about frequently here. Um, so yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, we're, we're portion packing these items and that does generate a lot of plastic waste. Um, we're in the process right now of beta testing a corn plastic, a corn-based plastic. It doesn't actually have plastic in it. It's just it's like oat milk, right? Oat milk isn't milk, um, but it's corn plastic. Um, we're really interested in seeing if we can move to a completely compostable um, packaging solution. Um, we're already there with our cardboard, so our casing, our cases of boxes, um, but that's where we are with um, packaging. Additionally, um, we are working to create um, a pathway for compost um, and digestion of our things like pineapple crowns, um, you know, the, the rinds of our watermelons or the rinds of our um, melons. So there's a lot of loss there, even though that's not an edible, edible product um, that we'd really like to see deferred into something more useful. And that's another area where I think there will be more technological advances soon that will allow for us to you know, participate in programs like that right now, the cost of composting is actually really astronomical, um, but there is actually incentive language, even in the most recent Inflation Reduction Act that Congress just passed um, that will allow um, for purchases of things like um, digesters. So whether that's on site here, whether we decide to do an, a digester on site or we decide to partner with um, a company that specializes in composting, that's a huge one for us too, because we lose, you know, um, or we, we, you know, have to throw away a lot of those pineapple crowns, um, you know, those, those waste items. And um, yeah, that's something that, you know, our team is, is very invested. We have a lot of folks who are really invested in sustainability within the walls of the company that are um, bringing that up pretty frequently. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the All question. Right. Uh, we've got one more. Um, I can read it. Can you read it? Who do I, who do I reach out to? I, is this a question for SIFT or for um, DNO? I wonder. I'm assuming that's probably for SIFT. <laughs> uh, we, we, have a, we have a list we, we create, and I can get into that if you want to talk about that offline. Um, oh, go ahead. Uh, so one more question came into the other. What is the biggest challenge you see in the short and long term for getting continuing to get these healthy uh, vegetables to um, economically challenged uh, areas and children? Yeah. Um, to go back to the previous question really quick while it's fresh, um, we did send all this to our um, school partners if they were able to tune in um, as well. But oh. short, short term challenges and long term challenges. That's a great question. Honestly, a very real short-term challenge is during the pandemic, um, USDA made all school meals free. So um, it didn't matter your income level as a kiddo. Um, you didn't have to go through that application process for free and reduced lunch. All children received free lunch. And that did a really um, wonderful thing in removing stigma around receiving free, um, free and reduced lunch because everybody was getting lunch for free. Um, 
my my friend is a, I have a friend who's a single mom. She has a seven year old and a nine year old, and um, her seven year old is like just a, a hilarious. She's a ham, and she, every single day the whole school year she would always come up with a tray, and she'd be like, "Is this still free? I just need to know. Is this still free?" <laughs> she was trying to look out for Courtney, but um, but all that to say, this year um, schools are going back to that traditional paid model, um, which does pose a challenge. Um, USDA did increase. Um, some of the reimbursement rates, and then also um, it is is trying to really get the word out in schools at the school level and then state level and national, trying to get the word out to help families apply to get free and reduced lunch um, and try and again, remove those stigmas or, you know, help uh, do that in a way that's not, you know, a teacher handing an application to a kiddo in class on their desk, right? Like, you know, in a way that's more discreet. But I really see that as potentially a barrier for participation um, specifically with those kids that kind of teeter on the edge of the poverty line. Um, that's that's a tricky spot to be. And that's I saw that a lot when I was working at the community center is mom and dad made just enough that they didn't qualify for certain assistance programs. And so in those cases, it's, it's just this catch-22 of like, do I make more money or do I make less? And then my kids can get all these resources. Um, so that's going to be a challenge. Um, this year, and it's something that the whole school nutrition community is very concerned with. Um, yeah, we were just in uh, at the national conference earlier in July, and it's top of mind. Long term, you know, I think equity and distribution is going to continue to be a challenge. Um, being from Kansas, um, Kansas is actually the only state that doesn't participate in this um, one of the government programs. It's called DOD Fresh. It's um, a segment of entitlement dollars that schools receive and it's just earmarked for produce purchasing. Um, Kansas is an incredibly rural state, 3 million people. Um, it's an incredibly um, just sparse in the way the population is distributed. So in terms of equity to access, I have been blown away and so impressed by up here in the Great Lakes, it's just so much more population dense. The access to amenities, including these foods is, is just, it's just head and shoulders above what kids in Kansas honestly can access. So in terms of equity, I think about states like New Mexico, Montana, Mississippi, um, you know, I think about, you know, higher poverty states like, you know, Florida, New York, maybe Alabama, Georgia, are they going to be able to get equitable um, resources and distribution as much as, you know, other areas with more economic activity? All right. Great answer. Um, all right, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. So I wanna say uh, thank you to everybody for joining us this morning. Thank you to Megan for coming. And um, just to let you know, we are we have already locked in next month where we'll be joined by the um, Agricultural Incub Incubator Foundation to talk about what's happening in Northwest Ohio's agricultural space. Um, so be looking for information on that. If you guys have any other questions, you wanna reach out to me or Marissa, please do. And we appreciate everyone joining us this morning. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Marissa. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thanks, everybody. And recording to this will be going out later today if you guys would, would be interested in it. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks.